Hey everyone, Aimer back with another Mission Impossible episode review. This time I am reviewing from the Revival series Season 2, Episode 8, which is called The Fuhrer's Children. So this one starts out in Oregon, according to the byline, where a neo-Nazi orator, who we will learn is Richard Kester, is riling up a crowd with some horribly racist rhetoric. His daughter Eva comes up to the podium and whispers to him that there's a government agent amongst them, which, who Richard points out to the throng, and the race traitor is quickly, quickly beaten and hung to the roar of the crowd. Jim uses spy speak at a horse riding facility to get his instructions. The mission, Kester is the leader of the increasingly popular and violent White People's Coalition. And his organization has been robbing banks and armored cars to finance their activities. The man who was hung was indeed a government agent, and now Kester is positioning himself to be the leader among several worldwide neo-Nazi organizations at a meeting in Germany. The IMF must discredit Kester and eliminate his influence. We get the usual apartment scene with way too much exposition for my liking, but it is what it is. The IMF planned to set up at the hotel where the meeting will take place. And before he was killed, the agent, Gerard Mercer, had learned that Kester was planning to display a secret weapon or unleash a secret weapon at the meeting, which Kester hopes will cement his leadership. Richard and Eva arrive at the hotel early. Shannon is the manager. Max and Grant take the place of employees, setting up the hotel with cameras. Kester has his first meeting with the others, all wealthy and ruthless men around from around the world. Jim joins Kester as mercenary computer hacker Van Olsen, so that Max and Grant can gaslight the Kester suite. He offers Kester the idea of creating a computer network to propagate his message, exciting Kester to the point that he wants to make a deal right away and invites Jim up to his suite, worrying Jim as he knows his people are up there. Max is able to escape through the window, but Grant stupidly tries to hide in the bathroom, where Eva is just coming out of the shower, holding him at gunpoint. Kester slugs the Negro, his word, not mine, who was either trying to rob him or rape Eva, and Jim intervenes to get hotel management. Kester replies he'll handle it his own way, and prepares to shoot Grant, but Jim says it can wait so that they don't attract attention just now. Kester says that makes sense. Maybe he'll make a tournament or something out of it, he says. For now, he just plans to keep Grant in the wine cellar. Grant is able to pass him a paper he pulled out of the wastebasket, giving the IMF a clue. Nicholas channels Grant's spirit and uses the computer to do an IMF 80s Google search, determining that the Rudolf Silas from the note is a cargo ship that Kester owns. Max, Shannon, and Nicholas head to the port, getting on the ship and telling the captain that they need to look for contamination, since the ship is coming from Southeast Asia. The captain is hesitant at first, but allows the inspection after being told that without it, no one will be able to board or leave. Meanwhile, Jim tells Kester that he was also involved in creating the security for much of the world's banking system, so he has back doors into it. And he can use the salami technique, which really exists, to drain bank accounts without being detected. Jim shows him the shiny gold pass cards that he can give to the other leaders, which will give them access to the network, but will allow Kester to keep control of the funds. And with that, Kester hears the Fuhrer speaking in his head. Jim asks him to set up a meeting with the others to demonstrate the power of the system. Shannon and Nicholas can't find anything aboard the ship in the cargo holds, and Max warns them that Kester has arrived with one of the other leaders, Froger. They head to a door in the side of the ship, wherein we find a group of boys quietly watching video footage of Adolf Hitler. And their headmaster, for lack of a better word, they call him headmaster later, Vogel, leads them in what I guess is a patriotic song. Kester explains that the boys have lived on the ship since birth, somehow, and believe that Hitler is still alive as their god and master, and that Kester apparently speaks through him. Nicholas hears the singing and discovers to his shock what the secret weapon is taking some pictures and radioing Jim with the audio evidence. The boys are taken by bus to the hotel, where they are led by Eva to one of the private bunkhouses, and they tell manager Shannon uh, to see to it that their presence is kept secret and they are not disturbed by pesky things such as radio, TV, the outside world. As she leaves, Shannon overhears Kester telling the boys that he's planning a hunt, 
which she likely she realizes likely means that Grant is the target. So the IMF formulates a plan. They are right, and Vogel sets Grant up with a tracking collar and puts him in a snare trap for the boys to find. After the boys set out, Max shoots Vogel and Eva with tranquilizer darts and puts them in a jeep, with Nicholas putting on a mask and becoming Vogel. They quickly head to find Grant and fortunately arrive just as the boys find him and ready their crossbows to shoot. Nicholas as Vogel says the hunt's over, orders them to head back to their bunkhouse, and of course they obey, allowing them to rescue the frustrated and angry Grant. Nicholas as Vogel then tries to explain to the boys that they were going to take someone's life, which is wrong. The boys tell them tell him that they were told their, their enemies have horns and they eat children, which Nicholas explains is obviously not true, and tells them to go talk to Grant, which they do, beginning to realize that he's a person, just like they are. Nicholas's Vogel has told Kester that Eva is taking Grant's body away for hidden burial, explaining her absence, and Shannon found subliminal tapes placed while the boys sleep, which she's replaced with their own. Jim joins Kester and the other leaders for a demonstration of his hacking technique, with Grant relaying information through Jim's glasses. Froger gives him the number of his Swiss account and menacingly pulls a gun out, indicating to Jim that his method better work, or else. After some tense moments with some more stupid dialogue and him trying to appear confident, the transfer goes through, and Froger verifies it with his bank, impressing the throng. Nicholas's Vogel introduces the boys to their substitute teacher for the evening. Grant, who tells them about Martin Luther King and his beliefs. Kester speaks to Shannon about making sure that everything is perfect for the final meeting that evening, and Shannon is able to signal Nicholas that Kester is on his way to see the boys. Fortunately, nothing about the changes to tonight's plans is revealed. Meanwhile, in the wine cellar, Eva wakes up, breaking a wine bottle to free herself from her bonds. Shannon spots her running outside towards the bunkhouse, racing after her with the jeep and shooting her with the tranquilizer gun again, just as Kester exits and is able to hide her under the tarp. It's time for the big meeting, and Kester is voted leader of the Unholy Consortium, with Froger collecting all of the shiny bank cards from the others to present to him. At the dinner that evening, it's made official with a bunch of other people present for the ceremony dinner, Nicholas's Vogel brings the boys in. The music begins, as the Nazis expect, and Kester explains things to the others. Nicholas's Vogel is introduced, but makes it clear to all that Kester deserves all the credit for what they are about to see. The performance begins, and Grant changes the video to show Dr. King instead of Hitler, while the boys sing Abraham, Martin, and John, visibly upsetting Kester and the others. Nicholas takes the boys out as Kester throws a fit with the others advancing on him as Jim and the others make their exit. Mission accomplished. The writers really don't make this easy on me in the revival. I had to think about, okay, so what grade do I give this? And I had to put on my big ranking list hat uh, in order to do so. I looked at some other episodes that were not great. And I said, okay, is it better than this? Is it better than that? And one that I found that I said in terms of overall quality of plot uh, was from season one, the episode called The Greek. I gave that episode a D. And, which I think is actually a really, really fair grade. If anything, it's a little high. And I said, you know, I'm going to say that this episode is just maybe just a smidge above the Greek in terms of the overall quality of the episode. In terms of, okay, if I had to pick an episode, I'm going to spend 50 minutes watching it. Would I watch that one or would I watch this? And I'm thinking, yeah, I would probably watch this, but, you know, it's not really a clear-cut choice. I'm making a decision that this is just a little bit better. It's difficult, like it is with a lot of episodes, to break this down into just kind of good and bad because of a whole lot of, you know, real-world issues that kind of go with it and behind it. But to start with a couple of things that I thought were good, I'll put them in that category. First of all, I would say that the casting choice of 
Albert Salmi. This is one of his last roles before he died in 1991, not long after this episode aired. I think that was a good choice. He fits the profile physically of how one would picture a leader in the position that he's in. He's got that kind of, he, he's got the right kind of face. He's got the right kind of look, the overall mannerisms. He's even got the little mustache thing going on. So I think that that was good on behalf of the producers to choose him. I also find it interesting. I've commented before about how, you know, sometimes the revival series was so prescient about things that would happen in the future because it was just at that right time where, you know, some technology was becoming mainstream and the ideas about what technology might be able to do in the future were kind of developing. They were really all in their infancy. But when Jim talks about the idea of creating a computer network to get Kester's message out there to the world. I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, you're talking about exactly the kind of stuff that is happening. Now we have a name for it. We call it social media, of course. But, you know, here we are on a TV show in 1989 talking about developing and creating a social media network. Wow, that I found to be really, really interesting. But I didn't find a whole lot of other stuff that I could point to in this episode and say, yeah, that's really good. Uh, you know, over and beyond just, you know, kind of the regular stuff, the gadgetry and the planning and the usual kind of stuff that is, is, is quote unquote good in just, in just about every episode. I'm trying to pick out things that are a little bit out of the ordinary here. So let me move on to some stuff that is kind of weird to me. One thing that has actually bothered me in previous episodes, for some reason it, st it stood out a little bit more in this one. Nicholas rips up his mask of Vogel when he knows that he's going to need it again later. That seems like a real waste of resources. Like maybe it's not a big deal for Grant to just kind of run the machine again and make a Vogel mask. But, you know, wh why would you do that? Th isn't there a way to kind of take it off to, with, 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 without completely ripping it up? He did it before. He's done it many, many times. But the one that really stands out to me is back in uh, the season one episode, The Fortune, where he had put on a mask and all of the regalia of Luis Barazon. And literally in front of the Barazons, he like rips it off his face. And I'm, and I'm like, you're going to need it again, buddy. Like, why would you do that? Maybe in that one, he kind of did it for effect, but I, I don't know. That, that just bugs me. Like, why would you do that? Doesn't make sense. Especially when it wasn't really even necessary for him to take it off in the first place. He was with the IMF and, you know, a, a scene or two later, he's back as Vogel again. So what's the big deal? At the, the other thing that bugged me that was weird, at the big meeting at the end where the Nazis are all sitting down having dinner, where did all these other guys come from? You know, there were only five or six guys, but, you know, they, they, they elect Kester by a vote of four to one. So there's five guys in this little, I guess, senior council or whatever. And then there's like the, all of these other guys who are just kind of invited to the party or for the ceremony or whatever. Um, that, that was kind of weird. There's no explanation for where they come from or why they're there. Moving on to stuff that is just bad. There's the usual stuff that I complain about in just about every episode. There's a real a lot of really bad dialogue. I almost don't feel like mentioning it anymore. Here it's a little bit excessive. There's a lot of really stupid cabbaging stuff. I didn't like that. Also, the big the, the really, really huge problems here have to do with just blatant, blatant plot holes. First of all, Jim just gets to show up at the hotel and be this Van Olsen guy without any kind of verification or whatever. Now, this kind of rolls into what I consider to be the huge, huge, huge problem with this episode. But just to stick with that point for now, 
It is mentioned in the apartment scene that Kester never actually met Van Olsen. But come on, there's got to be some thing, some kind of prearranged back and forth. You know, it would have taken all of five seconds. Normally in a situation like this, what the IMF does is they find the real Van Olsen. There's no explanation of why he doesn't show up or how he gets taken out of the play or whatever. But there should be a scene where he gets taken out of the play and they search him and they find, you know, whatever identification they have. Another Nazi episode from season one, The Legacy, they did exactly that. They did it again in the revival, right? Because, you know, obviously these guys who don't know each other need to have some way of identifying one another or identifying that, you know, this guy's part of our group. Then we have the plot hole of where Grant gets himself into trouble by being in the Kester suite at the beginning, he's working with Max to kind of gaslight the room and all of that kind of stuff. First of all, nothing becomes of that, which is a huge problem. Nothing, you know, all of the little devices and things like that that they put in there with the idea of, oh, you know, we're going to have listening devices and it almost looks like they were going to set up some kind of hologram or something like that. That's how it, it was starting to look. But nothing becomes of that. It's ridiculous. There was absolutely no point for that scene except for Grant to get himself into trouble. They go up there figuring that, you know, Jim is going to keep Kester busy so they can do what they need to do. Max goes in first. He hears the shower running. I don't know why Shannon, with her walkie-talkie that she, she has, it's been demonstrated, tells Max and Grant, be careful, Eva is up there. Max listens and says, oh, somebody's in the shower, so somebody's obviously here. But he doesn't even turn around and say to Grant, hey, be careful, somebody's in the bathroom. And when Jim and Kester go up to the suite, Max dumps out the window, where does Grant go? He goes to the bathroom. <laughs> it's like, what in the world is going on here? Um, and, and that also rolls into the, the next part of it. I, 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 I can't really avoid it, but I do want to save it until after I make all of these points. I don't know if there's something I'm, else I'm missing from this scene, but it clearly just seems to me like a scene to just establish what the Kesters are about, to allow Richard Kester, the character, to use a racial slur, and 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 just kind of move the plot forward in that direction because that's what the plot demands. I don't think I'm missing anything, but if so, if I am missing something, please somebody point it out. Then later on, Eva wakes up in the wine cellar by herself and escapes, and then that causes a whole thing where Shannon has to kind of chase after her. Here's a problem: where the hell is Vogel? <laughs> they, they, tra they they shot both of them, and I'm, and they said explicitly, we're going to hide them down in the wine cellar. Uh, where's Vogel? I know that for production purposes, obviously, John Bell, the actor who plays Vogel, is busy doing other things. But come on. You know, this is a real, real oversight and a huge plot hole. Even if Vogel was physically there and Eva kind of comes to her senses and realizes, oh, I don't have time to waste, I'll come back for him or whatever, um, even that would have not made much sense because it could have helped each other both escape and that would have caused real problems for the IMF if they were if they both escaped. Yeah, that, that just a gigantic plot hole. I want to talk, before I get into the real problem with this episode about the callback and one other point that I want to make. The obvious callback for this episode is the season one episode from the original series called The Legend, where you have a guy who wants to be your Fuhrer, right? And begs everybody in one way or another, let me be your Fuhrer. We all remember that. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that because it raised a very, very interesting question in my mind. I hope you find my discussion about it as interesting as I did. I, I really hope so. Just a reality check, which, is which was really problematic to me. These young boys who were told Kester has kept hidden on this boat for, 
several years, obviously. Some of these boys look like they're 10 or, you know, years old at least. Something like that. So much is so ridiculous and problematic about the whole premise involving these boys. Of course, it's, it's completely ridiculous to expect or, or to believe that there would be such a quick change in attitude from these boys who, we're told, have been kind of indoctrinated almost from birth to believe certain things. And then all of a sudden, the writers wish us to believe that these children are naive, innocent, some combination of the two that allows them to just be easily swayed into now believing that, oh, gee, maybe, you know, people of other races are not bad. Maybe what we've been told isn't true. I guess what they're asking us to go with is the idea that all they know is obedience and now their headmaster or whoever is telling them to be, is telling them something different and now they're going to be obedient in that way. You know, anybody who's a parent knows that children... Children don't work that way. So the, so much is there. I also couldn't just help thinking, like, I don't know. Again, maybe it's just me. Shouldn't these boys have other problems? Physi like psychological problems aside. But physical problems. You know, things like vitamin D deficiency. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me. But, I mean, obviously these boys don't get a whole heck of a lot of sunlight, I wouldn't think. So, you know, they're going to have physical and medical problems, not to mention the fact that obviously they're not around women very much, which is going to cause other issues for them, you know, physically, mentally, physiologically, probably. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's just crazy to me. I get what the writers were trying to do, but boy, it just does not come across well, especially when it comes to the kids. But now let's get to the heart of the matter. Richard Kester as a villain. His plot and what we see in this episode, I think that a lot of people, I think, would classify this that he does with the kids as a special kind of evil, okay? Which makes him a special kind of villain for different reasons, like those villains in Mindbend. Using the words lame and schmuck don't seem to quite cover it. You know, they're appropriate. They're definitely appropriate to describe him, but that, that that's just scratching the surface. There's just so much more to it when it comes to the Richard Kester character especially when I'm analyzing him as a villain. And the biggest problem I found is that he just has an aura of ridiculousness about him. It even envelops the IMF into just being kind of lazy and overconfident like he is, where they just miss some really, really basic things, like, you know, not covering themselves when Max and Grant go up to the suite. You know, obviously not drugging Eva to the point where she's completely out of the picture for as long as they need. Uh, stuff like that. So the IMF is almost kind of being dragged down to Richard Kester's level. Another thing, not verifying that this Van Olsen guy is who he says he is. You know, what's up with that? He really thinks that just by doing what he's doing, at some level, he just believes, if I just keep the kids all in one place and show them videos about Hitler and have this guy Vogel tell them certain things, that will make them Nazis. I really don't see anything there about, you know, the hate indoctrination that should be concomitant with that. These are just kids who are just being told ideas that don't really have any meaning in their heads. They're being told that, oh, there's this guy Hitler, he's still alive, he's your god and master. Okay, so what does that mean, sir? They don't even have the wherewithal to ask such questions, right? Bottom line is, so much about Kester and his plan just seems like, you know, your classic South Park underpants gnomes plot. I do not understand 
how this is supposed to work. And I'm pretty sure that the writers didn't either. It, this was not about the idea of having a, a, a decent villain who has a decent plan. This is just kind of throwing something out there to, uh, to, to, to generate a certain kind of feeling. And I'm going to um, move on to that point. I feel, obviously I wasn't there in the writer's room, but I think that the writers were a bit trapped with this episode. They started it, they wanted to see it through, but then they realized that they had a problem. They have a villain here that they've created, which they cannot make out to be competent. Because then what they're doing is they are creating a guy who is a Nazi and giving him the credit that he's actually smart in some way. And I think that they that they just couldn't do that. So they had to make him and his troop kind of seem relatively incompetent, you know, reckless and dangerous and don't underestimate them and all of that kind of stuff. But competence is not a word I would use for these villains, not in any way, shape or form. The problem, of course, is that when you do that, when you make incompetent villains, and here they're almost doing it deliberately, you're turning your villains into complete jobbers. And that means that there is zero challenge for the IMF. They are going after a bunch of people who you can't even say are lame schmucks. They are hapless nitwits. They're absolute clowns. And, it, and that is the big problem with this episode. You are creating a script. You are creating an episode where you cannot have a good, a, a competent villain. And that is really problematic for an episode like this. There's a further problem to that. For some villains, like the ones I mentioned back in, in, in Mind Bend and in some other episodes, villains were complete Debbie Downers. You can be apathetic to them. You can say, I don't care about this guy. I don't care what happens to him. But in this episode, you can't be apathetic to Richard Kester as a villain. You, you just can't. He is a literal Nazi. And, and, and that comes with what, with that belief system and what that represents. You have to hate him. You have to. But I don't want to care about this guy. I don't want him to exist. He creates these very visceral feelings inside me that I cannot ignore and I can't eliminate them from my thought process and I don't want them there. That's at the same time very disturbing and, 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 and very dissonant in my head. I want to say to the writers, why are you doing this to me? Why are you giving me this character that I that I, I don't want at all? I mentioned that the big callback for this episode obviously is the episode The Legend. And I had to ask myself, the villains are very similar in terms of their overall goals. You could even argue in terms of, of their techniques. They share a lot of similarities. Richard Kester and Friedrich Rudd. And I thought to myself, why does Richard Kester bother me so much? But Friedrich Rudd didn't really bother. Was it because Rudd's plan, while being quite ridiculous, was maybe kind of a little bit more low key? Was it because it didn't seem to involve any kind of overt violence, like in the beginning where they, where they hang the guy? Maybe the way that, that maybe the treatment of Grant and how bothersome that is. Maybe because this is kind of so in your face. Maybe because it involves kids. Maybe because it's not clear that the IMF will fully pull this off because, you know, it's not just taking out this guy. It's about fixing the kids and that sort of thing. I don't know. Maybe is it because there is so much to unravel and, and, and there are so many unanswered questions? For me, part of it is even including the logistics of how we got here in the first place or how Kester got there in the first place. You know, all of the logistics 
that Kester would have to do to get this group of boys to this point. He had to feed them. You know, he, first he had to kidnap them in the first place. He had to keep it all secret. He had to feed them. He had to find a guy like Vogel who was willing to give up his life and live on a ship and, you know, take care of these boys. <laughs> you know, like, geez, like, like, where did all that come from? That, that, that kind of bothers me just thinking about all of that stuff. The legend. That episode made it a lot simpler. Frederick Rudd had an idea. He formulated a plan, and it's much simpler to keep a handle on. And I think that it was because the whole thing started with what was obviously a really fake dummy of Martin Borman, which is, you know, basically what his whole plan centers around. And he's passing this off to a bunch of old, not-so-smart Nazis, and, and that's really the plot. And in that case... You know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, all of these questions don't come up. The how did he get to this point thing is not so important. Because from the beginning, we know that this guy isn't completely on the ball because of how lame that Martin Borman dummy is. And I think that that kind of, of, of tells us, or at least makes us feel as viewers, okay, you know what? This is a TV show. Just sit back and be entertained. There might be other things that I can't maybe put into words right now, but I really wanted to think and get across why I feel those episodes are so different. There's something over the top and a little bit sinister about this episode, which is probably not even deliberate on the part of the, the writers, but but it's there. And I, I don't know. I would really, really love to hear what other people feel about this. Maybe it's just me who feels this way. Maybe other people are seeing something that I don't that allows them to just sit back and, and not feel the way that I do and just treat this as entertainment. But for me, there's more here than just kind of meets the eye. And especially when I compare it to that episode, they're so different in the way that they make me feel. I would love to hear your comments about this episode. It, 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 like I said, did it bother you? What bothered you? Or were you not bothered? And, you know, did, did you feel that, oh, come on, it's just a TV show and it's, it's a little hokey and over the top, but, you know, whatever. Maybe I'm making too much out of it. I would love to hear what you have to say. Please keep those comments coming. Thank you guys for watching this video. Please like this review video and please subscribe to the channel already. I already mentioned, please keep the comments coming. I'm going to wrap this episode up here. This is longer than I thought it would be in terms of, re of a review. Thank you for sticking with me on this. See you next time.